He was Malaysia's Prime Minister for more than 20 years. Now Mahathir Mohamad wants the job again at the age of 92. Can he make a comeback? What does it mean for Malaysia? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Now, Malaysia will have a general election within 60 days, and it could be the most tightly contested poll since the country's independence in 1957. Mahathir Mohamad, Malaysia's longest serving prime minister, is making a comeback. And he's determined to depose his former protege, the current prime minister, Najib Razak. Razak is under pressure after being accused of fraud in a multi billion dollar state fund. Parliament was dissolved on Friday, and the countdown to elections is now on. Florence Louis has more from the Malaysian capital. All across Kuala Lumpur, this is becoming a familiar sight. Flags of the ruling coalition known as Barisan Nasional. But it's seen its support dwindle in the last few years. It lost its two-thirds majority in 2008, and in 2013, it lost the popular vote for the first time. This is the first election since news of a corruption scandal surrounding state investment fund 1MDB broke. More than $4.5 billion has allegedly been siphoned from the fund, set out by Prime Minister Najib Razak. Now, Najib has denied any wrongdoing, and Malaysian investigations have not found any evidence of impropriety. Challenging Najib is his former mentor and former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. The 92-year-old was angered by the scandal. He's returned to politics and set up a new party. Opposition politicians say the odds are unfairly stacked against them. The government has changed electoral boundaries. It's introduced a new anti-fake news law. And Mahathir's opposition party has been banned for 30 days. Elections have to be held within the next 60 days, but they're widely expected to be held sooner. Well, known as the father of modernization, Mahathir Mohamad was one of Asia's longest serving leaders. He became Malaysia's prime minister in 1981 and served for more than two decades until retiring in 2003. He broke with the ruling United Malays National Organization Party two years ago and joined the opposition alliance. He helped Malaysia survive the Asian financial crisis of 1998 and transform into an economic tiger. But he was criticized for deploying the controversial security law known as the Internal Security Act. His critics say it permitted him to crack down on the media, activists, religious leaders and political opponents. Mahathir presented himself as a moderate spokesperson of the Muslim world. Following the September 11th attacks on the United States, he supported the global war against terrorism, as it was called. Well, let's get the thoughts of our guests now. Joining us from Kuala Lumpur is Charles Santiago, an MP and member of the opposition Democratic Action Party. In Singapore, Oe Sun, senior advisor at Asia Strategy and Leadership Institute. And also in Kuala Lumpur, Eric Situ. He's the Barisan Nacional Deputy Communications Director. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Eric. So why did Prime Minister Najib dissolve the parliament now and prompt these elections? What was the reason? Well, we dissolve parliament because that's what is provided for in the constitution. Um, the parliament term has ended. Uh, Prime Minister Najib uh, had promised in the previous election to go, the previous elections in 2008 to go full term, and this is exactly what he did uh, this time around. So we look forward to elections uh, uh, coming up within the next month or so, depending on the election. Elections commissions. Um, uh, wisdom on when are the best dates. Is the BN so party, ruling nothing, party ready for uh, elections? Oh, yes, we are. Um, and, and plus, you know, we have one full term, so we are as ready as we can ever be. All right. The ruling party confident it's ready. Charles, why did Mahathir Mohammed in particular decide to make a comeback now, do you think? Uh, before I answer your question, can I uh, quickly respond to uh, Eric's uh, statement? Uh, I think Barisan is calling for the elections at this time, uh, one as provided by the Constitution, but more so they are in fear at this time. Uh, there is a concern right now that uh, people, including the Muni Putras, uh, Malays in particular, are now looking at the opposition parties uh, to throw their support. Uh, and 
fear is driving uh, uh, Prime Minister Najib at this moment. And because of fear, he has done three things uh, in the last uh, 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 one, one and a half weeks. And something that your, your earlier presentation uh, presenter had noted. First is the constituency delineation, uh, where it gives unf unfair advantage to the ruling government uh, in both parliamentary seats as well as the state seats. Number two is the anti-fake bill. Uh, this is to stop any discussion uh, on the One Malaysia Development Rahar, One MDB, uh, which uh, is a huge scandal. Uh, and even the economist has gone as far as saying that you have a tiff for a prime minister, uh, referring to Prime Minister Najib. And third uh, is actually the, the biggest fear Badesan has is against Dr. Mahade, uh, because Dr. Mahade appears to have uh, galvanized Malay support against AMNO, against uh, Prime Minister Najib. And therefore, uh, his party, for all intent and purposes, has been re registered uh, yesterday. So it clearly points out that. Uh, the AMNO and as well as Najib are in a panic moment, a panic moment, uh, and therefore they are pulling all uh, uh, efforts in order to stop the opposition, especially Dr. Mahade, uh, from making any any further moves to further deteriorate uh, the situation all of right. AMNO. Let, let me give Eric a chance to come back in on that one. Uh, you've picked up, Charles, on a point I was going to mention. Well, let's go to a little bit, a bit earlier than planned, though. Eric, the I'm sure you've heard the suggestion that the ruling party, the BN, is moving out of fear that as the passage of time is not in its favour. Uh, well, Charles is basically just mirroring the, um, the opposition's uh, propaganda. Um, well, first of all, I would like to point out that the regulation uh, affects, um, you know, seats on both sides, particularly on the opposition side. Yes, some of the seats in, in the opposition um, and the constituency of the opposition's control has gone up in terms of number of voters. But there are also 26 seats that has gone down um, uh, in, in voters, uh, in voter name counts. For example, the, the seat of uh, Subang, um, and, which is also under the uh, opposition, has gone down 40% in terms of voters. Uh, Regulation is something that we've done uh, in the past. Uh, Tun Mahathir has done it many times. The last uh, time we did this was in 2003, um, 15 years ago. So it's high time that we do it again based on our country's laws. Uh, and in 2003, after it has been done, the opposition five years later won five seats and denied uh, the Barisan National, it's a the traditional two-thirds majority. So regulation goes on both ways. Um, it's not something that. But the, is the BN unusual. did lose uh, for the first lose. time the, the popular vote, right? Uh, yes, in two eight, uh, in um, in two one three. That's the first time we, we lost it. Uh, but in two eight, we lost five seats and lost the um, the, the two thirds majority. That so, we so the before. trend, Derek, it, it, it's not it was not looking good for the government, was it? At the previous ones, um, well, in two or three, the opposition also complained bitterly that the government or Barris National was stacking the, the dice in their favor in 203. So they were making the same allegation again this time around. Now, you must remember that the opposition has always said that Malaysia's general elections, each and every time we have a general election, it is the dirtiest in history. Um, they said it in 1990. They said it every year. They said it five years ago. They said it 10 years ago. In fact, in 1990, the DAP, the wrote a book that's called that is titled The Dirtiest Elections in History. So it has always been the opposition's uh, game plan to call this dirtiest in order to get sympathy votes from the, uh, from the voters. In the last election in, um, general, uh, in 2013, they made the accusation that we had you know, tens of thousands of uh, phantom voters and right. blackouts that we stole the elections. Right. This time okay. around, they can't use that anymore. It was, all right, I can see. No. Uh, so we don't get bogged yeah. down in too much history. I can see Charles wants to come in. Let me give you a brief chance, Charles, and then I'd like to get the in, uh, input of uh, uh, our guest in Singapore. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, he leaves half the truth. Uh, half the truth is not mentioned. For example, in this relation that took place, the constituency I represent, Klang, has got 136,000 people, and it moved from 97,000 to 136,000. Whereas 
Barisan, uh, 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 the AMNO uh, seats, have 38,000 and 42,000. The role of the Elections Commission, according to the Constitution, actually says you must have one constituency, the number of voters, about the same as the other. About the same as the other. But here, you do not have one person, one vote. Here, one person vote in an AMNO area is worth four votes in my constituency, Clank, for example. So this is very unfair, totally unfair. And the gerrymandering has been done in such a way, and I agree with uh, Eric Sito that some of it is small, but the small ones are kept uh, uh, in, uh, to ensure that the Malays will vote for AMNO and Barisan National. Right. But I okay. want to impress upon Mr. Eric Sito that the Malays are going to vote this time against uh, I'm no and by well, let's see. Time will tell, I guess. Standards. It's what, 60 days? So uh, I guess we'll be talking about this in the not too distant future again and see whose predictions are right here. Let me bring in OE's son. Can Mahathir oust the Barisan National for the first time in Malaysian history? I guess that's the key question. What do you make of that, O? Well, I think it would be a very much an uphill task for Dr. Mahathir. I think undeniably he still retains a certain residual influence primarily over the rural uh, voters and perhaps even urban uh, lower class uh, voters. But uh, I think uh, traditionally this uh, cohort of voters, they are primarily motivated, for example, by the need for development for more resources for development, as well as, uh, for example, spiritual needs. And Dr. Mahathir, not being the incumbent uh, prime minister, I think he is in no position to provide sort of the material development which uh, many of these voters desire, nor the spiritual side of their requirements, uh, which traditionally is taken care by by the Islamist party past. So combining these two uh, sort of factors, I think it's very difficult for Dr. Mahathir to uh, sort of translate his residual influence into uh, votes at the polls. Yeah. What would it mean for the country, oh, though, if the Barisan Nacional doesn't win? Even though you think it's probably not the most likely scenario, some prizes do happen sometimes in elections. What's at stake here for the country? Well, I, I, I think uh, if you have uh, the Barisan National return to power, of course, uh, well, you have more of the same of uh, the last uh, half a century or more uh, with, uh, uh, you know, this uh, slew of uh, promises and sometimes delivery of uh, developments uh, to some areas, mm -hmm. but also, of course, the various uh, attendant uh, challenges and, and, and so on. Uh, with uh, a, a possible change of government, on the other hand, of course, you will have a very new uh, sort of new slew of uh, promises to be delivered. But I think uh, this round it's, uh, of election, it's perhaps uh, not as much uh, as exciting, quote unquote, at least uh, for me as the last round, because okay. I think the, the conclusion is almost uh, foregone. Namely, yeah. Let me, let me take that point back to Charles in Kuala Lumpur. The economy is growing at the fastest rate in three years. Why do you think, Charles, that most Malaysians will want to jeopardise or risk that for an unknown sort of uh, future, I think, as O was uh, characterising it there? Uh, I think um, you're right in saying that the economy is growing at the tune of 6% uh, uh, per annum, that, that's a given fact. But unfortunately, Malaysians are feeling poorer. Malaysians don't feel that they're benefiting from How this How are they growth, feeling poor? Uh, that, yeah, uh, let, me, let me finish. Uh, how, uh, for example, the cost of living has gone up quite a bit. Uh, gone up quite a bit, uh, given also that your wages are also quite low. Uh, one of the problems that we have today, for example, a recent UNICEF report uh, says that stunted growth is rearing its head among Malaysia's poor, uh, especially those who are living in low-cost homes. Uh, people's savings have dwindled to a point that they can't save one ringgit uh, uh, per month to as a tide, to tide over to the next month. Uh, so people, but, uh, Charles, people's, hasn't the government uh, been helping uh, people like that with subsidies and handouts? Well, uh, apparently not. Uh, if they were giving subsidies, then you will not have a problem of stunted growth. 
people will be able to eat um, good food, nutritious food. Uh, the point is that because of high cost of living uh, and low wages, uh, they are unable to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite clear from the study that UNICEF did uh, that came out two months ago. Uh, in fact, a recent study by the uh, uh, Bank Negara Malaysia, Malaysia's Reserve Bank, uh, Central Bank of Malaysia, uh, it also says that the cost of living has gone up. Uh, and okay. it puts a very high figure compared to what people are receiving. Let me, let me put you, that 50 point. Of let me put some of those points to Eric. 50% of Malaysians earn less than 1,600 ringgit. How concerned, uh, so how, how concerned, is the, country that all right, how concerned is the ruling party, the BN, Eric, with the fact that the cost of living is rising? The BN has always focused on uh, increasing the people's income faster than the, the cost of living. I think uh, inflation is uh, something that um, a growing economy will experience. Uh, the challenge is to make sure that um, the, the poorest among Malaysia, the, the, the bottom 40 income group, will always be assisted by, by Marissa National, uh, by, by the federal government. And we have done that with numerous schemes, you know, from uh, subsidized housing to subsidized food groups, uh, basic necessities, exempting these um, this essential items from GST. Uh, we have never uh, believed that um, ignoring the poor is good for us. Of course, those are the people that we must help the most, and we have done so. OK, it, what do you make of the Charles suggestion, Vince though, Trump. Eric, that that's not the only reason why you're confident going into these elections, because also you have a huge advantage. Favourable electoral districts, control of the mainstream media, the new fake news bill that's been approved, and so on, and so on, say critics. Are they wrong? Nobody can deny that there is a advantage for incumbency. However, the mainstream media... Well, this is, is more than the usual incumbency when you, when you carve up electoral districts in a certain way, when you've got control over the media. Well, that's what the critics say, uh, at least. Well, we, we talk about the, the carving up of these electoral um, constituencies previously, I mean, about the regulation. And, I, and as I pointed out, in 203, the opposition made the same accusations against us, but ended up winning, you know, in their biggest victory five years later. So um, I don't think that's a fair accusation to make. Uh, as for mainstream media, uh, we all know but, that... But you lost the electoral... Um, you lost the, sorry, the, the popular vote in 2013, we agreed, and you, but you still won the election. So does that not speak to some truth to what the opposition says about how the electoral system is set up? It gives you an unfair, uh, 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 an unfair advantage. Well, popular votes, the way the election uh, uh, in Malaysia uh, is set up is no different from the USA or the UK, where it is possible to, to win um, elections without the popular votes. And that's what happened in the UK, that's what happened with President Trump. Um, but that's how the system is set up. So if I were the opposition, I would go after the constituencies with the lowest voters instead of, uh, you know, fighting very hard in places where there's hundreds of thousands of All people. Right. So this number of voters are really well known to, to uh, the opposition for many years. So All right, that's let me, not a complaint. Let me bring in uh, O again from Singapore. Going back to the issue of economics, so I'm, I'm wondering what you make of research that I read, for example, from Sunway University, um, that suggests, looking at past election results, that you can't always correlate the election result with, uh, with the economic indicators. In other words, you know, how much of the economic concerns are a real driver in these elections? Is it as clear-cut as the opposition uh, might paint it? Well, sometimes uh, during, shall we say, non-election time, when you have uh, popular surveys, you will hear people saying, for example, that the economy is their top concerns, you know, rising cost of livings and so on. But when push come to shops uh, during election time, very often, of course, then people would uh, switch their mind, would switch their mindset towards, uh, shall we say, more quote unquote emotional issues, and uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, scandal related issues. Uh, sort of abuse-related uh, issues and, and, and so on. 
But I think the, in terms of How about uh, the fears economy, based on race and religion? Uh, in addition, yeah, the, yeah. For example, those are very, uh, shall we say, emoting issues, race and uh, religion. But even uh, in terms of the economy, I think sometimes uh, in addition to rising costs of uh, livings, there is one other factor, namely the increasing wealth gap huh, between the very rich and the very poor. So the overall economy might be rising at the rate of let's say five to six percent but for example the wealth is concentrated uh, in, in in the elites and thereby a lot of people are, are feeling the pinch i mean in addition to the rising cost of uh, living yeah. all right we can go to charles how solid is the alliance within the opposition camp right now especially between mahathir Mohammed himself and anwar ibrahim who's in jail uh, i think uh, for the first time in opposition politics uh, we find a very cohesive uh, opposition. Uh, and uh, each of the parties have made sacrifices uh, in forging this coalition. And I think, uh, for example, my own party, the Democratic Action Party, uh, this time around will forego the use of its rocket uh, as the logo and instead will now t uh, take on the Ka'adilan, which is Anwar Ibrahim's party's uh, logo flag as part of the coalition's uh, uh, flag, a logo. Will, will, so will that cohesion is... last, though, if uh, Mahathir Mohammed wins the elections and Anwar Ibrahim, who, I mean, the two of them were enemies, now allies, if Anwar comes out of jail, will that cohesion last? What happens then? Well, I think uh, there is, we have a manifesto, uh, and I think you're also looking at uh, somewhat reform uh, Dr. Mahathir. Uh, and he has, uh, uh, together with the coalition partners, have agreed that It'll be a two-term uh, uh, prime minister's uh, term. The two prime minister's term will be two terms, not more than that. Uh, and uh, his, his his role himself will be very limited to one year or maybe a year and a half at the maximum two years. Um, of course, nothing is uh, I mean nothing is you know quite confirmed and predict. Uh, 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 one can you know uh, uh, one can assume that both Anwar and uh, Mahade will work together in order to ensure that the opposition, if it comes to power, or when it comes to power, will lead a better Malaysia than what we have today. I think that's a promise from both these men, uh, that this we will lead this to a better Malaysia. But I think sometimes, as a result of their uh, previous and historical animosity, right. people tend to, uh, you know, raise this issue uh, again. And that's All a right. very fair, fair thing to do. All right, we've, but got, I think we've generally, got a minute Malaysia, left. Forgive me, we've just got a minute left, so I want to give 60 seconds to Owen and say whatever happens in this election, is it in a sense already a game changer that you've got somebody like Mahathir Mohammed with his history of being in the BN now running um, with the opposition? Is this going to be a game changer no matter how it shapes up? Well, Malaysian politics is uh, notoriously capricious. Eh? Enemies and friends uh, you know, would last for, let's say, a few months. You, you never know what would happen in a few years' time, you know, I mean, not to mention a full term or, or so. So uh, I think the important thing for people to decide is whether they do want a change of government. If they do, then they should vote accordingly. If they feel that they want stability, then they would also vote uh, accordingly. I think this election, at least as I said for me, is not as exciting right. f uh, as the last one, where you really see the desire to, to move forward to another phase and, and so on. That kind of uh, euphoria is simply missing in this election. All right, we'll see how it does play out. Let's for now thank our guests very much, Charles Santiago, Oe Sun and Eric Situ. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now is goodbye.